Good evening and welcome to the Marion Minor Cook Athenaeum. My name is Dante Tapo and I'm one of our two student fellows this year. In the American Diplomatic Corps, when appointed ambassador, the appointee is understood to hold that title for life, even after they have retired the position and transitioned to new roles and responsibilities back home. Consequently, he or she is expected to bring the characteristics implied by the title ambassador, courage, diplomacy, and empathy to those new responsibilities. Ambassador James A. Joseph's leadership across the realms of public affairs, business, and education reflect those characteristics. In 1995, President William Clinton appointed Ambassador Joseph the U.S. Ambassador to South Africa as the first and only American ambassador to present his credentials to President Nelson Mandela of post-apartheid South Africa. Ambassador James Joseph is Emeritus Professor of the Practice of Public Policy at the Sanford School of Public Policy at Duke University. He has been a leader in residence for the Hart Leadership Program and was the founder of the United States South Southern Africa Center for Leadership and Public Values at Duke and the University of Cape Town. He has served in senior executive advisory positions for four U.S. presidents, including President Jimmy Carter as Undersecretary of the Interior. As an ordained minister, he has taught at Yale, Yale Divinity School as well as here at the Claremont College where he, is also the, where he was also the university chaplain. Joseph has also served on many national boards, including the Brookings Institution, the National Endowment for Democracy, the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation, the Children's Defense Fund, and City Year South Africa. He serves presently on the board of MDC, the successor to the North Carolina Fund, and as a member of the Board of Advisors of the Bloomberg School of Public Health at Johns Hopkins University and the Andrew Young Policy Center at Morehouse College, among many others. After graduating from Southern University in Yale, Joseph began his career at Stillman College in Tuscaloosa, Alabama in 1963, the stronghold of the Ku Klux Klan in the United States, where he was also founding co-chair of the local civil rights movement. A frequent speaker to academic, civic, and religious audiences, he is the author of three books and the recipient of dozens of national and international awards, honors, and honorary decrees, including in 1999, the Order of Good Hope, which is the highest honor South Africa can bestow on a citizen of another country. A reminder that audio and visual recording is strictly prohibited. Please join me in welcoming Ambassador James A. Joseph back to Claremont and the Athenaeum. Thank you very much. It's a real delight to be back in Claremont, where I have so many fond memories some of them at CMC and some of them at the other colleges and some of them in the community. I am um, always reminded when I speak to a group after dinner of an experience I ha had when I was in the Carter administration. I was in the South Pacific to swear in the governor of one of the American territories when I was invited to address a joint session of the legislature. Just before I was scheduled to speak, I leaned over to the speaker and said, Mr. Speaker, how long do I have to talk? And he said, Mr. Undersecretary, you are our guest. You may speak as long as you wish, but in about 35 to 40 minutes, the lights are scheduled to go off across the island. I know that uh, CMC has uh, paid its electric bill, <laughs> and that is not a danger, but it seems to me like a good time. So if you will lend me your ears for about 35 to 40 minutes, I want to talk about building and sustaining community in a badly divided nation, what I learned from Nelson Mandela. The historian Arthur Schlesinger once described the United States as a country that is neither fixed nor final. We are a nation, he said, that is always in the making. It is this making and remaking of America that concerns me tonight. Some of our fellow citizens are asking, is social cohesion still possible in a nation badly divided by race, religion, and region, as well as by color and culture. Others are arguing that we form community out of crisis, and we form community by accident, 
but do we really know how to build community by design? Still others are pointing out quite correctly that we live in multiple communities simultaneously. We are not only divided within communities, but we are divided by communities. And so the question is, is it still possible to form a more perfect union? While those who wrote the American Constitution did not include people who look like me as full persons in their almost sacred document, they had the language right when they reminded us in the preamble that in order to form a more perfect union, we would have to establish justice. And if we were to ensure domestic tranquility, we would have to promote the general welfare. Even among those who insisted that this statement of the public values of the nation also include providing for the common defense, there were some in their ranks who understood that the best way to demonstrate the efficacy of our democracy to critics abroad is to demonstrate that it can work equitably for all of our citizens at home. Yet, despite our commitment to building and sustaining a caring community, recent demographic changes have led some Americans to dream of a time that never really was and to seek to share the benefits of community with only those who fit their comfort zone, people who look like them, people who act like them, and people who think like them, that is, if they think at all. It is this romanticizing of ordinariness that threatens not only the potential for social cohesion, but narrows the idea of a public good and those selected to lead us in public life. So how then should we respond to the challenge of building and sustaining community? There are many ways to answer that question, but tonight I want to draw from my experience in working with Nelson Mandela as he sought to lead his nation in building a new democratic order. It has been my great pleasure to have worked as a senior level for four United States presidents, for a business leader who was a Renaissance man and an extraordinary corporate statesman. But the man from whom I learned the most about what is needed to heal, unify, and lead a badly divided nation was Nelson Mandela, one of the most respected and revered leaders of the 20th century. There are three things that stand out when I reflect on how Mandela was able to unite a badly divided country and to begin a process of a democracy. First of all, he appealed to a shared sense of connectedness that transcended cultural, geographical, and other traditional boundaries. Secondly, Leadership was for him a way of being that was deeper than the power of position. And thirdly, he saw reconciliation as both a public value and a public process. Let us look first at the shared sense of connectedness that was a fundamental part of the concept of community of the black South Africans who constituted more than 80% of the population. Nelson Mandela and the older generation of leaders of the struggle for liberation grew up at a time and place where the notion of community was best expressed by the Kosa proverb, people or people through other people. Which is to say, that my humanity is bound up in yours. What dehumanizes you dehumanizes me. I belong to a greater whole, so I am diminished when others are diminished by oppression or treated as though they were less than who they are. It is not I think, therefore I am. 
It is I am because you are. I am fully human because I belong, I participate. I share because I am made for community. It is this notion of shared interdependence that led some of the early Warren tribes to adopt the concept of community called Ubuntu. Each tribe had what was called a war healer whose job it was to come together after a conflict to initiate measures to restore both the victor and the victims in the full standing in the community. It was said of Mandela's ancestors that they had a short memory of hate. There was also a bit of tribal wisdom that led Nelson Mandela to say, long before Joseph Nye wrote his first essay on soft power, that if we do not solve conflicts with our brain, we'll ultimately try to resolve them with our blood. It is when I look for a concept of community appropriate for a world that is integrating and fragmenting at the same time that I think most of Nelson Mandela. The implication for our own efforts in the United States to form a more perfect union has to do with the need to re-examine and reaffirm the centrality of community in the American narrative. It is indeed odd that the tradition of community that de Tocqueville and others wrote about seemed to have receded as an American affirmation. A primary calling of policymakers and opinion leaders is to help get the narrative right, to help bring, bring back into balance the le legitimate romance of rugged individualism with the equally legitimate effort to form a national community where individuals embrace, reaffirm, and take responsibility for supporting and promoting a common good. And so I want to speak next to what I learned from Nelson Mandela about leadership in a badly divided nation. In far too many places, the prevailing notion of leadership has been that of military manufacturing models of command, control, and even coercion. Those who have sought to bluff, bully, or buy their way into influence. Nelson Mandela spent 27 years in incarceration. He was in prison while the internet was being developed. He was in prison while we were learning the many uses of the cell phone. He was in prison while we were being seduced by new technologies. And he was in prison while the world economy was becoming more interdependent. But he came out of prison, took over the leadership of his party and his country without missing a beat because for him, Leadership was a way of being that was deeper than the power position. Mandela's influence came from the power of his personality, the elegance of his humanity, the loftiness of his ideals, the wisdom of his judgment, the calmness of his temperament, and the power of his personal story. What stands out in the observation of many who've commented on Mandela's leadership style during the early years of the transition from apartheid to democracy was his ability to make people feel that with him around, almost anything was possible. Much of the respect for him came from his ability to listen, to learn from others, and to show respect for their traditions while maintaining respect for his own. He was a skilled negotiator who knew when and how to compromise, but he won many concessions during the development of the new democracy 
because of his knowledge of Africana history and culture. His capacity to seduce when coercion was neither possible or desirable has been described as a classic case of knowing your adversary well enough to draw upon key moments in their own history to demonstrate why your proposal makes sense. Mandela went from prison to president in a small country on the tip of the African continent. Yet, heads of state and royalty from around the world beat a path to his door to seek advice and counsel, and sometimes for a photo op to prove they had been in his presence as a global icon. President Clinton said of him that when he enters a room, we all feel a little bigger and a little better because on our best days, we all want to be like him. Now, when I analyzed what made Mandela so influential and so widely respected and admired for a leadership program that I developed at the University of Cape Town, I developed a curriculum around what I consider to be the most essential uh, Mandela leadership traits. And there were really four elements. The first is one in which you are very familiar. It is what is caused, called emotional intelligence, a quality that has fortunately caught the attention of leadership and management studies around the world. But it is the mastery of the other three elements that made Mandela unique. And so the first was emotional intelligence. The second is probably best described as moral intelligence. One of the great challenges we face today is how to think about, how to talk about, and how to apply values to our work in public and private institutions without getting caught up in the politics of virtue or the parochialism of dogma. I cannot overemphasize what a grave mistake it would be to allow questions regarding the appropriate role of ethics in our aggregate existence to remain primarily the domain of moralists interested almost exclusively in the private behavior of individuals. Reinhold Niebuhr, the great moral theologian who in 1932 wrote the book Moral Man and Immoral Society, could have been speaking directly to our own times when he warned of the difficulty of applying the moral sentiments of individuals to the moral imperatives of groups. He went on to say that while we know a lot about what is right and what is to be revered in individual behavior, we have made very little progress in applying morality to the problems of our aggregate existence whether national, economic, racial, or organizational. I like, therefore, to make a distinction between the microethics of individual behavior, the private virtues that build character, and the macroethics of our aggregate existence, the public values that build community. You see, religions do a good job of affirming moral absolutes but well, we need leaders today who can cope with moral ambiguities. Mandela was not a very religious man in a formal way, but he had a moral sense that would have made Rhino Niebuhr proud. The third element of leadership as a way of being is social intelligence. And here I refer, first of all, to Mandela's ability to recognize and protect the dignity of difference. Some of our leaders look at diversity and they want to homogenize it to fit their comfort zone. They fail to understand that the more diverse we are, the richer our culture becomes and the more expansive our horizon of possibilities. Jonathan Sachs, the British rabbi who wrote the book the home we build together, argues that if we were all the same, we would have nothing unique to contribute 
nor anything to learn from each other. Yet if we were completely different, we could not communicate. And if we were exactly alike, we would have nothing to say. So the rabbi concludes that we need to see our differences as gifts to the common good. For without a compelling sense of the common good, difference spells discord and creates not music but noise. It, it was because of this form of social intelligence that Mandela was so effective in persuading others that diversity need not divide, that pluralism rightly understood and rightly practiced is a benefit and not a burden, and that the fear of difference is actually a fear of the future. Social intelligence also helps us understand the role of culture and context in influencing and in shaping leadership styles and strategies. I grew up in Louisiana, where one of the most admired leaders in the history of the state was Huey Long. To understand and exercise leadership in Louisiana, for, for example, you must understand Louisiana culture. While much has changed, there are still vestiges of the Louisiana way Huey Long had in mind when he said, if we had ethical government, many of our people would not like it. <laughs> the fifth and final element of what Mandela brought to his leadership in South Africa and his influence in the world at large was a form of spiritual intelligence. It was probably what motivated him while still in prison to write to his wife, Winnie, that a saint is a sinner who keeps on trying. In using the term spiritual intelligence, I refer to his ability to cope with the unexamined and the unknown, the capacity to transcend the reality we see and to imagine alternative possibilities, and to ability, the ability to step back, renew oneself, and to find meaning and purpose in our existence. A friend of mine refers to this, what I call spiritual intelligence, as privileged access into one's own soul. Spiritual intelligence, then, is especially important at a time in our history when people are so divided and many are alienated, not just from other groups, but they are living in a kind of psychological exile from their own past. Now, it is spiritual intelligence that reminds leaders and would-be leaders that there will need to be agents of reconciliation. And it's here where I want to shift gears and to go a little deeper into what I learned from Nelson Mandela. He saw reconciliation as a process rather than an event. Earlier this week, Desmond Tutu, the former chair of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, emphasized this point when he said, reconciliation is a process that begins within, in our hearts, questioning our own prejudice. Then it ripples outward through our family to the community and broader society. And then he said, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was a beginning not an end. My own conclusion in living in South Africa full or part time for 18 of the last 19 years is that this process involves at least five different stages of forms of reconciliation. And we, we tend to make a mistake when we think of reconciliation as one thing. The first of these forms or stages is individual a kind of existential rebalancing of the self. Kurt Osmal, an architect of South Africa's Truth and Reconciliation Commission, described this bringing back into balance as undoing historical illusions, deceptions, and misteachings. To make this point, he liked to quote William Wordsworth, who said, to be mistaught is worse than to be untaught. 
No errors are so difficult to root out as those which the understanding has pledged to uphold. When past prejudice, stereotypes, and conflicts are carried from one generation to another, the act of reconciliation has much to do with softening or eliminating old memories. This does not mean condoning or forgetting past actions, but remembering them in such a way as to reduce the desire for, desire for revenge. Forgiveness research in the field of clinical psychology provides clinical evidence to support the South African emphasis on forgiveness as a necessary part of individual and communal health. Forgiveness reduces the stress that comes from anger, hostility, bitterness, hatred, and resentment, all of which lead to high blood pressure and impaired neurological function. Long before forgiveness researchers, Confucius had anticipated their scientific work when he said, if you devote your life to seeking revenge, first dig two graves. The second dimension of reconciliation is communal. I've already argued that the black South Africans had a natural urge toward bonding and community that had its genesis in the notion that people are people through other people. But I cannot help but repeat the insights from the Howard Thurman that I share as often as I can. Thurman was an African-American mystic, poet, and theologian who was an early mentor of Martin Luther King. He was fond of saying, I want to be me without making it difficult for you to be you. This is precisely what the new population groups who are fueling our economy and enriching our civic life are saying to those who feel threatened by their presence. I want to be me without making it difficult for you to be you. Can you imagine what the debate about immigration would look like? Indeed, how different our world would be if more Americans were able to say, I want to be an American without making it difficult for an African to be an African, an Asian to be an Asian, or a Latin American to be a Latin American. Can you imagine how different our communities would be if more Christians were able to say, I want to be a Christian without making it difficult for a Jew to be a Jew, a Muslim to be a Muslim, or a Buddhist to be a Buddhist. In his last book on man's nature and his communities, Rhino Niebuhr wrote that the chief cause of our inhumanity toward each other is the tendency to form we groups and to pose them over against they groups whom we come to regard as somehow outside the pale of our humanity. In other words, when we come to regard another person's difference in status as a difference in kind, we can exploit them, we can dehumanize them, or even seek to annihilate that group without disturbing our conscience or challenging our values. And that is why the third dimension of reconciliation is political. Different kinds of conflict require different forms and ways of reconciliation. This is an especially good time to remember that political reconciliation is not dependent on the kind of intimacy that other forms of reconciliation may demand. Rather, statecraft and politics require peaceful coexistence and respect for the humanity of the adversary. Forgiveness may come later, after the creation of confidence and the building of trust. Some South African leaders like to tell the story of a Danka elder who, in reflecting on the Sudanese conflict, said, reconciliation begins by agreeing to sit under the same tree with your enemy to find a way of addressing the conflict. At one level, this may mean simply to stop killing one another. On another level, 
It involves a willingness to work together with one's enemies or former adversaries in pursuit of a solution that is not yet at hand. Although this sense of reconciliation is incomplete, it does interrupt cycles of conflict and lay the groundwork for something deeper and different. Now the fourth form of reconciliation is economic. And here it is where the Mandela Reconciliation Project has had its least effective impact. The political empowerment of the majority has far outpaced economic empowerment. The debate about how reconciliation should take place mirrors our own debate here in the United States. We rightly praise Mandela. We rightly praise Tutu and that generation of labor leaders, liberation leaders for what they had to say about forgiveness. But we rarely remember Desmond Tutu's lamentations about economic reconciliation shortly after the presentation of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission to Man report to Mandela. In South Africa, Tutu said, the whole process of reconciliation has been placed in very considerable jeopardy by the enormous disparities between the rich and the poor. The huge gap between the haves and the have-nots poses the greatest threat to reconciliation and stability. The argument here is not over whether or not there should be some national effort to empower those population groups who had been the victims of a policy of intentional underdevelopment. The debate is over how it should take place. To quote again the former archbishop, who is affectionately referred to as the arch, unless houses replace the hovels and shacks in which most blacks live, unless blacks gain access to clean water, electricity, affordable health care, decent education, good jobs, and a safe environment, things which a vast minor majority of those who benefited from apartheid have. Unless these things happen, we can just as well kiss reconciliation goodbye. Now these are not the words we tend to hear about Mandela and Tutu from those seeking reconciliation in the United States. The emphasis is on the forgiveness from those who have been the victims, while very little is said about the obligations of those who have benefited, and what form of public policy is morally defensible and politically feasible. As the warm-ups begin for the next presidential campaign here in the United States, we hear candidates from all sides of the political spectrum trying out elevated speeches on the persistence of poverty and inequality. One can only hope that when we honor the memory of Nelson Mandela at the next anniversary of his death, we'll hear as much about what he had to say about economic reconciliation uh, as about his emphasis on forgiveness and individual reconciliation. I would hope also that our national debate would be based on enlightened self-interest rather than on which of our candidates is the most moral. Mandela demonstrated that we do not necessarily need to use moral language to achieve moral ends. Long before the authors of the book The Spirit Level documented how more equal societies almost always do better than less equal societies. Mandela was arguing that inequality lowers the quality of life for all of us, not just the poor. Many years later, the picture that emerges from comparative national research is that inequality is socially corrosive. In other words, there is now empirical evidence that inequality damages social relationships. 
and that measures of trust and social cohesion are higher and violence is lower in more equal societies. That is the message we must convey as we remind ourselves and our fellow citizens of our obligation to each other. We have an opportunity to change the narrative from simply a moral imperative to enlightened self-interest. I learned a long time ago when I left Claremont to become an ethics officer in a large transnational business that the language of morality can sometimes be a deterrent to achieving moral ends. Enlightened self-interest sells in many interests where the public interest does not. N many Americans ask me, what can we learn from South Africa about racial reconciliation? I like to point out that in South Africa, race is on the table. In the United States, it is under the table, if it is anywhere in the room. The South Africans chose to emphasize truth as a prerequisite for reconciliation because they were trying to reconcile not only the alienation among cultural and racial groups, but they were trying to reconcile conflicting images of the past as well. In the United States, we may first need to reconcile conflicting images of the present. When Ralph Ellison wrote The Invisible Man, he pointed out how we had made the poor invisible. But today, every white family knows or knows about at least one black family that is doing well. So they assume that those who are not are the victims of self-inflicted wounds. Many fail to see, and if they do see, they fail to understand the insidious legacy not simply of slavery, but formal segregation that was our own intentional underdevelopment of a people. There is occasional talk of the potential of truth and reconciliation commissions in the United States. Can they bring us closer together? Could they help us build and sustain a spirit of community among the diverse groups that populate the nation? When Archbishop Tutu proposed the Truth and Reconciliation Commission for the United States, the response of many African American leaders was that what we need is a Justice and Reconciliation Commission. Now the South Africans also debated whether they should form simply an Amnesty Commission, a Justice and Reconciliation Commission, or a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. They chose truth because they recognized that they had to reconcile conflicting images of the past. The idea of a truth and reconciliation commission that simply allow people to tell their story may have short-term therapeutic value. But if such a commission is to contribute to long-term healing and reconciliation that can endure, it must seek not only forgiveness, but economic reconciliation as well. When asked about the potential of truth and reconciliation commissions in the United States, and I'm often asked that, I'm reminded of the caution offered by former education minister Carter Osmond, who played an influential role in the early thinking about the South African Commission. Looking at the various examples elsewhere, he said, there is no prototype that can be automatically used in South Africa. We will be guided to a greater or lesser extent by what's happening elsewhere, notably in those countries that manage to handle this highly sensitive, even dangerous process with success. But at the end of the day, what is most important is the nature of our particular political settlement and how best we can consolidate the transition in South Africa. 
Something similar can be said in the United States. At the end of the day, what is most important is whether any such process or any process at all will contribute to the commitment of the framers of the American Constitution to form a more perfect union. And so the final form of reconciliation in South Africa in the Mandela years was what I like to call cosmic or spiritual. The claim common to all religions that we are not here alone, that each of us is a part of something bigger and more mysterious than the self. It is to say that the search for a higher level of being, the urge toward a universal connectedness, is a reflection of the human condition. Mandela understood that it is in our common search rather than in our different answers that we find common ground. The religions of the world may define and address holiness from different perspectives, but they are one in their recognition that because of our spiritual kinship with the larger universe, prejudice and discrimination should have no place among people of faith. When the Truth and Reconciliation Commission submitted its report and completed its phase of reconciliation, many of us had hoped that the churches and other religious groups would pick up the torch and carry on the work of reconciliation. But these groups who had played such a fundamental role in the struggle against apartheid seemed unable to lead the struggle for transformation. Now I've already admitted and noted that Mandela was not a leader who wore his faith on the sleeves of the colorful shirts for which he was known. But he understood that the most effective leaders are not only agents of reconciliation, but they are purveyors of hope. Leaders who can look beyond what they see and imagine alternative possibilities. Hope for them is not so much an act of memory as an act of imagination and courage. It is the realization that what we can imagine, we can very likely create. We look at today's turbulence in our politics, in our religion, and our civic life, and it is easy to retreat to the sidelines with disgust and to say that the system is broken, but I have other struggles to endure and other battles to fight, and then quietly acquiesce, leaving it to others to shape our future. So we need to develop and deploy leaders who are not only agents of reconciliation, but purveyors of hope. And here I have in mind something very different from optimism. Hope theology and hope psychology both argue that optimism adopts the role of the spectator who surveys the evidence in order to infer that things are going to get better. Hope, on the other hand, enacts the stance of the participant who actively struggles against the evidence in order to make things better. I've actually said all I've said tonight because I hope some of you will choose to be participants who dare to struggle against the evidence in order to make things better. Many of us in the anti-apartheid movement had become convinced that never in our lifetime would we see a democracy in South Africa with one person, one vote as the central theme. But despite the evidence, Mandela continued to believe that fundamental change was possible, and it was possible in his lifetime. When you find a leader who is a purveyor of hope, you will find someone who, like Mandela, calls us to a higher purpose and lifts us into our better selves. Mandela was effective because even with the possibility of a sentence of death in the Ravona trial, he was able to look beyond the present and see a purpose not yet fulfilled. Even in his worst days in prison, he believed that someday hope in history would rhyme. Now, 
The South African model of reconciliation is certainly not a blueprint for the myriad forms of conflicts tearing our world and our nation apart. But it should at least remind us of the potential of the human spirit that no alienation is absolute and that someday hope in history could rhyme. People who are disappointed and discouraged about the state of our union ask me what keeps me going. In the midst of the continuing dismantling of some of the progress that once brought us closer to a more perfect union, optimism about the future is being replaced by pessimism about the present. But I keep before me the insight from an anonymous poet, my minister father liked to quote to make a profound theological claim. The soul would have no rainbows had the eyes no tears. I'm also reminded from time to time of these extraordinary lines from the character in Sophocles' play. History says, don't hope on this side of the grave. But then, once in a lifetime, the longed for tidal wave of justice can rise up and hope in history rhyme. So a hope for a great sea change on the far side of revenge. Believe that a further shore is reachable from here. Believe in miracles and cures and healing wells. If there is fire on the mountain or lightning and storm and a God speaks from the sky, that means someone is hearing the outcry and the birth cry of new life at its turn. I keep on trying because I hear these words echoing in the clouds and bouncing, bouncing off the mountaintop. I keep the faith because I believe that once again, the long for tidal wave of justice can rise up and hope in history rhyme. My fondest hope is that you will too. Keep the faith, and thank you. Now, I think we've left some time for conversation. I don't want to answer any questions that are not being asked, but if you have questions that you'd like to ask, <laughs> please go ahead. Uh, we will now be taking questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand. Shannon and I will approach with the microphone. And as always, preference goes to students. Hello again. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, I was wondering how you think South Africa's lessons uh, in terms of reconciliation can be applied to other, perhaps more violent post-conflict situations, and especially in considering the recent release of Eugene de Kock, like we were talking about earlier, um, where you think the line might be between, um, I guess, revenge and justice and offering amnesty that's perhaps not due and criminality, um, if you could well, talk a little bit about that. When, when the South Africans were considering a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, they looked at similar commissions in about 15 other countries. And they decided that none of those, as ex exactly as they were composed, would likely work in that cultural and historical context. And so they designed their own Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Now, when you ask me where it might work, I would have to simply repeat what the, I quoted uh, Kurt Osmo as saying, that there is no prototype that will work elsewhere. But what the Truth and Reconciliation Commission has demonstrated, that alienation is not absolute. And the potential of the human spirit suggests that even in those most violent situations, there is the possibility of reconciliation. In order to realize that possibility, one has to master the cultural and historical context, but there are principles of how the South Africans did it that might apply. I, I attended a conference uh, by a group of scholars from Israel and Palestine who were looking at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa and to see whether it could work in that situation, that conflict situation. 
a general conclusion was that South Africa was different. First of all, it had different kinds of leadership. There were no de Klerks and Mandela's and the other situation for one. And number two, the South Africans were seeking a one-state solution and on and on it went. And so the truth of the matter is there are things that one can learn, but the most important thing is their belief that alienation was not absolute and in the potential of reconciliation. Now, I, have, I had people when I was ambassador talking to folks outside who thought that Nelson Mandela was naive and that reconciliation would never happen. The truth of the matter is there have been some dramatic examples of individual reconciliation and Nelson Mandela was the best example. And some people say if after 27 years of incarceration he could come out and forgive, who am I not to forgive? As a matter of fact, I said that myself. I was involved in the anti-apartheid movement all of my adult life, and they were signing the Constitution in the place where they had shot and killed 65 people. And I was sitting there because we used to say, remember that incident. And then I thought to myself, who am I to sit here and not to forgive? And there's Mandela telling us to forgive after all he's been through. So, I mean, that kind of example, but you're not going to do it without leadership. You're not going to do it without the belief that alienation is not absolute. Hi, thank you so much for speaking this evening. I really appreciated it. Um, and I'm so glad that you pointed out uh, the economic inequalities that still exist in South Africa. Um, it's something I'm extremely passionate about and something that I do think is still an issue to the reconciliation process. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about how to best provide economic reconciliation. Um, and I know I spent time in South Africa and there's been talk about you know, providing housing, um, how to do employment opportunities and things like that. And uh, what would create less inequality? What form of um, aid and help? Well, you know, if I knew the answer to that, boy, I could make a lot of money as a consultant to the South Africans. <laughs> uh, but uh, first of all, uh, the South Africans struggled with what kind of an economy to create in the transition. And there were a lot of people who were looking at the ANC charter and what ANC leaders had said in the past who assumed that it was going to be an almost Marxist economy. And then they came up with a, an economy that uh, was a market economy. And I have people say to me, well, Mandela was so well recognized, he was so respected and liked in South Africa, he could have tried a different model. But I can tell you that even with Mandela, when I tried to persuade American potential investors to invest in South Africa in those early years, many of them were suspicious that South Africa was going to develop a Marxist economy. Despite all that uh, Mandela said, despite Mbeki as deputy president establishing that market economy, there was this sus suspicion. And so they were still not able to attract the amount of investment they needed to create the jobs they needed to create and to do the other things. And I can just imagine what have ha would have happened if they had gone in some other direction other than a market economy. Now, they did say that in creating a market economy, it has to fit our situation and deal with the needs of our people. But it was the kind of economy they created. The labor unions from the outset opposed the kind of economy that was developed. Uh, there is still tension uh, in South Africa around that, and many labor unions would like to see a different kind of economy. And so you hear their voices often. But I don't know what the answer is because they need, they need investment in order to create jobs. And I would hope it would be a more inclusive capitalism to use a concept that seems to be in vogue these days, uh, or a more responsible uh, kind of uh, market economy. 
And here again, some people think that's naive to believe that's possible. But I worked for a company for 10 years that was socially responsible and very profitable uh, in spite of the fact that we were responsible in so many ways. So I think it is possible, but we're going to need some leadership in the private sector uh, along this line, uh, among potential investors rather than just the South Africans. Anyway, I, that was a long answer to your question. I'll be short on the next one. <laughs> My table mates here. <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you again. Um, I'm curious, you spoke um, a little briefly about how in the United States there's sort of an uh, emphasis placed on the sort of forgiveness aspects of what we've learned from South Africa and less emphasis placed on the economic aspects. And I'm curious if you could speak a little bit more about what might be called the misapplication of um, some of Mandela's teachings that people take what is convenient for them, you know, that uh, the people who were oppressed ought to forgive um, and et cetera, and, and not placing the onus on the people who were historically oppressors and, and are still oppressors. And I'm curious, sort of, if you could speak to, if you see potential sort of remedies for, for that sort of misapplication and uh -huh. that sort of misremembering of, of what we've learned. Well, you said got off on the wrong foot. That was this romanticizing of Nelson Mandela, the global icon who forgave his oppressors. And that's wonderful. That, that's, that's, that sounds nice. And he did. But that did not lead to economic reconciliation. I um, mean, it led to good feeling abroad about Nelson Mandela and some good feeling at home. Now, what can you do? That's the $64,000 question. And I hope we'll get some answers in this next uh, campaign. Uh, how are we going to deal with inequity, inequality and, and poverty? Now, uh, the South Africans have tried a variety of things. But unemployment is still at about 24 uh, percent in the formal economy, though there's an informal economy that provides a, a lot of jobs that's not counted. So we have to figure it out. And Pippa, maybe you might be one of the people who can help do that. <laughs> yes. Um, given the continuing economic inequalities in South Africa, how much longer do you think the ANC will stay in power? Yeah. That's a great question, and it's one that I thought about a lot and uh, I get asked about a lot. The memories of the ANC as the liberation movement uh, has been larger than that of a memory of a political party. And so there are a lot of people who support the ANC because they led the liberation struggle that brought them a new democracy. Those members are beginning to fade, and a younger generation is emerging uh, who don't know very much about uh, that, that past and the role that the ANC played. So they're going to have to stand and compete as a political party like any other party based on their policies and the kind of candidates they put forth. It is difficult to say how long they will continue to be the majority party. I think it's going to be a while, a long while, before any other party leads South Africa. But the ANC is already beginning to lose some of the support it has enjoyed. But in the last election when folks were telling me this is the time that the ANC is going to be defeated, and Zuma is no, not going to be president. You know, the first time I heard that was when Mandela was running. And those same folks were telling me that Bootha Lazy was going to be the next president of South Africa. And he ended up getting about 5 8% of the vote. Uh, when uh, Mbeki was running to succeed Mandela, I heard this is it. Uh, the new party, the alliance between a couple of old parties, it's going to beat them. And they only got about 66% of the vote. And then I heard that when Zuma was running the first time. And he only got about 66% of the vote. And I heard that uh, last year when he was running again. And he only got about 61, 62% of the vote. So 
those astute prognosticators, uh, those political analysts in South Africa who know this, when this is going to happen, have been claiming when it was going to happen from the very beginning. So I don't think anybody knows at what time. The other thing is, when a significant opposition emerges, will it be from within the ANC, or will it be one of the political parties in existence, or will it be from the outside with a new political party? I don't think it's likely to be from one of the political parties in existence. They all have too much baggage. I think the Democratic Alliance has probably gone as far and is as large as it probably will get. They will probably win more local elections in the future, but when it comes to the national uh, election, I think the ANC will uh, get the majority for a while yet. Uh, but uh, it could be that, I mean, there have been split offs from the ANC, the COPE was the first group to do that. It was a group, a small group of middle class and professional blacks who didn't feel they had much in common with the folks in the union, and they split off, and they practically have disappeared now. Um, most recently in the last election, you had a group from the left or the right, I'm not sure how to characterize the economic freedom fighters. Uh, all I know is that they own Ruley and Ruff and, and whatever. But they have not been very successful, and we already begin to see them divide up. They are fighting now among themselves, uh, and they're probably almost ready to divide into uh, two political parties, and they got a very small percentage of the vote. So I don't know when the next split's going to come, and some people think that it will be when COSATU, the Congress of South African Trade Unions, decides to form its own political party. And the, and the split from the ANC. But it's very difficult to say uh, when you're going to see significant change. The only thing I would say is that it's not uh, immediate in the, in the near future. Yes. Thank you, Ambassador, for coming. Um, I just wanted to say that I really enjoyed our discussion here at the table. Um, it reminded me of the checkout counters and the pick and pays when I was in, uh, in Cape Town. Um, <laughs> I think uh, the question I wanted to ask was something that um, that um, Piva kind of touched on, on the misapplication of some of the lessons that we kind of pick what's convenient. One of the things that I was very struck, and one of the more, <clears throat> excuse me, the most poignant experience when I was there in the country was where, where a group of Afrikaner students in Stellenbosch University, the cradle and the birthplace of apartheid, were telling me, you know what, I actually think that I should, we should have a tax on us because we're white. And that really blew my mind and have how that they were so cognizant and, and, and aware of the, the historical legacy and the privilege that were displayed upon them. And I think, um, how do you see that we, we as like a community really, be, whether it's here or at, in our neighborhoods or in our country, um, develop that same level of cognizance and self-awareness and empathy? Well, first of all, it's, it's difficult to anticipate us doing that, particularly on racial reconciliation. As I said, uh, in South Africa, it's on the table, and they want to do something about it. Here, it's under the table, uh, if it's anywhere in the room. And so the first thing we're going to have to do is bring it back on the table and confront the inequalities that exist uh, because of race and because of other reasons. And until we are ready to confront those, I don't see us doing anything. And the ways we've tried to confront that in the past has is, is, is been superficial. Uh, John Hope Franklin was asked by President Clinton to put together a kind of commission on race. That's not what it was called, but that's what it was. And it ended up, despite the good work of uh, John Hope Franklin being marginal and not getting much attention. And if John Hope Franklin couldn't get a, the attention to, to do some significant strategizing about this, I don't know how we're going to get it. Uh, it's only going to come when we have national leadership that's willing to and is capable of confronting it. But it can't be one leader, uh, because one leader dealing with adversaries or an opposition that can stifle whatever that person thinks can have the best thoughts in the world. 
So we need more leaders uh, who are willing and wanting to tackle this, this problem. Uh, I, I must say I'm, I'm, I'm an optimist, uh, given the distinction I made between hope and optimistic. I'm hopeful, <laughs> but uh, I, I just don't see us doing that in the immediate future. Uh, but I, you know, I continue to be out there struggling, hoping that uh, we, we can be persuaded. I think the first thing that needs to be developed is a national will. And uh, strategies would follow a will. But as long as there isn't a national will, we're not likely to get any effective strategies. And that's why I said we have to maybe begin to develop a new narrative, uh, use new language about how this is an enlightened self-interest rather than as a moral imperative or any other way we might describe it. So we need uh, a new narrative that helps to develop a national will. And out of that might come leaders and strategists that might get us to the point where we'll move our efforts to form a more perfect union a little farther down the line. We will have time for about two more questions. Lucky me, I get to ask a follow-up. <laughs> <laughs> um, you talked about U.S. investment and how important that is to economic growth. And I wondered if you could speak a little bit about how, um, well, the international you know, crisis that had happened uh, had affected South Africa in a beneficiary way um, in terms of the RAND uh, kind of increasing um, and doing better and then, of course, there have been problems with it uh, also falling now that the economy has kind of picked up and developed um, in like the US and, and in Europe and things like that. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about how important that is that when US foreign investment flies away from South Africa, how that can affect things like employment rates and things like that. Um, and also maybe speak about how corruption plays a role in US foreign investment and where that kind of plays out um, in terms of whether or not we get more US foreign capital uh, or just foreign capital in, in South Africa? Well, let me, let me start with the latter, uh, corruption. If you follow the South African newspapers, you would think that everybody <laughs> in government is corrupt. I ran a, a leadership training program for a number of years in which I had 160 leaders go through it, and the focus on the, of the program was on value-driven leadership. And I tell you, these were people of great integrity. They are leaders already, but they are the next generation of people who will be the president and the leaders of parliament, etc. And some of them are already getting there. One of them is the Archbishop of Cape Town, who, who in Desmond Tutu's old job, and others are in parliament, and others are mayors, and some are in business, etc. And believe me, I have faith that these people are going to be the next generation of leaders of South Africa. On the other hand, I, uh, I was chair of a selection committee for something called Clinton Fellows, and Mandela had asked us to train some South Africans about civil society and how we use civic engagement to perfect our democracy. And I tell you, now that generation was in the 20s, mid-20s. And I met some of the finest young people uh, who are going to be, if not the next generation, the generation of that as leaders. So I have to tell South Africans who are so pessimistic that there's, everybody's corrupt and that this South Africa will be a failed state, uh, that you don't know your country is. And I hate to say as well as I do because they are South Africans. But uh, I've had the experiences I mentioned. I have traveled in every province, uh, know the local people and the people at the leadership level. And many of these people who are so dejected have never been outside their province. And they've only talked to people who look like them. And so there is this sense that these people are corrupt. There is this also feeling that these people 
are the same people as their maids, their gardeners, and their chauffeurs. They never had an experience or relationship with any other professionals. And so when the new democracy was emerging, a lot of people thought that it was their maids and their chauffeurs and their gardeners who were taken over. When there was this return of South Africans from around the world uh, who were highly educated, who had done all sorts of things, and uh, nevertheless, that feeling still exists that those people, because of traditional stereotypes, uh, are not going to be able to lead this country where it has to go, and that they're corrupt. And let me say one other thing about corruption. Uh, I read that in the papers, and frankly, if my only source of information about South Africa was from the newspapers, I'd be frustrated. No, I'd be depressed every day. <laughs> and there are some people who are depressed every day because of what they read in the newspapers. But the, uh, the international group that rates countries according to corruption has South Africa way down the line. And some of the countries that are our favorites and some of the countries with whom we are doing all sorts of business are far more corrupt in South Africa. And so let's get rid of this notion that South Africa is altogether corrupt. Of course there's corruption. There's corruption everywhere. I mean, you and I can talk about the corruption in the United States. And so don't let corruption be a deterrent uh, to investing when you end up heading an investment company or a business. Uh, now, the other part of your question, I got into corruption, and I forgot the first part. <laughs> Sorry, the first part um, was talking about uh, the, you, you know, you had mentioned how Mandela had kind of come back into, um, from, from prison and the world is more of an international economy um, and the now more so than ever. And yeah. how um, foreign investment uh, during the US recession uh, fled and into developing markets such as South Africa which caused US foreign investment in South Africa to grow. Um, but I also know that now that economies are doing better and some of that foreign capital is kind of fleeing these de developing economies and going elsewhere yet again. And I was wondering if you knew anything about that and if you could maybe comment on yeah. how well, foreign the, the, investment fleeing South Africa could also be uh, detrimental to the economic development that they're trying well, to do. Well, first of all, in the economic downturn, no, bank, no financial institution in South Africa failed. When financial institutions were failing everywhere, no financial institution failed. No big financial institution, no big banks, or, or et cetera. And, and so South Africa managed to, through that uh, economic downturn reasonably well. Uh, the second thing is that investments in South Africa have been in cycles from different places. Uh, when I first got involved in the anti-apartheid movement and uh, once the new democracy emerged and I was ambassador, uh, the majority of investments were coming from Europe. And, uh, you know, the U.S. began to invest more and uh, I can remember the time when American companies were providing uh, uh, more than 100,000 jobs in, in South Africa. And so th there, there was investment. But the, the American companies have been slow to appreciate that these are people with brains. This is, these are potential markets. And so the Chinese have recognized the potential of those markets and they have come in in a big way. And now they are replacing what used to be the Europeans, what was partly the Americans and the Canadians and the Chinese are the big investors. And, uh, you know, that's all I can say. The Chinese are coming in and, uh, uh, you know, I try to warn them to make sure that they protect their, their economies in the process and uh, because uh, the Chinese are coming in and they build big projects, but they bring in Chinese to do them. <laughs> and so it's not doing a lot for job creation. Uh, so. That's what's happening now, is the, the shifting of the ground for outside investment 
and americans a lot of americans are still operating on old stereotypes south africa is the gateway to the rest of the continent and many countries in africa are now growing at a faster rate than other parts of the world and if they want to get into those markets the best way to get in is through south africa but so something has to happen in the mindset of american investors in understanding how things have changed and it's not just a continent with a lot of babies with hungry bellies, swollen bellies. There are consumers out there ready to buy products from abroad. And so we need a paradigm shift in the way in which the continent is viewed. And particularly South Africa, coming in through South Africa and taking advantage of the new consumers uh, on the continent. One more. And oh, it's, Unfortunately, that, it? that is all the time we have. <laughs> Please join me in thanking Ambassador James Joseph. Thank you.